think will be very interesting. We will discuss, we'll, we'll see different situations and then we will discuss the management of the surgeon and we will have an opinion of the other two panelists. So uh, let's move to Dr. Sharif, and we don't waste time. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Wales. Thank you, Dr. Yahya. Um, let me uh, start by uh, sharing my present my first case. Um, let me go further. Someone has his camera on. Please turn off your cameras. Do not uh, start any videos because your 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 videos will show on on the recording. Please turn off all your cameras. There's a lot of cameras opened. Please turn off all your cameras. Okay, in order not to waste any time, let's start uh, this discussion. Uh, my first case, I'm going to present a case um, for a patient. Uh, he is, let me see it here. Yes. Uh, this patient is 84 years old. He's diabetic and uh, he's uh, single eyed. This is his uh, uh, only eye. And uh, his vision was uh, hand motion in this eye. Uh, the challenges in this eye is uh, uh, we're going to use a stain to, uh, to do the, the rexes. So um, the probability of Argentinian tear, although it was yeah, a little bit not uh, high, but uh, because I felt the, the court material was a little bit soft under me. So I thought, well, I'd, I'd better uh, use uh, a spiral uh, method for, um, for doing the, sorry, I was playing the video in a different uh, screen. Now you can see my video playing. The video is here, Dr. Rehi, Andak? Oh, I'm here, but I'm here. Okay, I'm play. I think I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the wrong screen or something like that. No, no, it's open, but it's open. Okay. Now I'm ready. It's okay. Available. Now you can see. All right. So uh, the so I started doing my rexes, like a small uh, rexes, and I started doing it uh, spiral. As you can see, I always prefer to do my rexes from the side port, and uh, it gives me more control, uh, and I do it with, uh, with my uh, cystotome. When I started uh, using the side port for uh, the, uh, the uh, rexes, uh, I usually had a uh, micro rexes forces with me. Now I don't, it, uh, as I lost mine. Uh, but uh, now with the, with, with the, from the side port, you can increase the uh, intra uh, ocular pressure, the pressure inside the anterior chamber without uh, any chances of leaking of the uh, visco viscoelastic material. Uh, now that I've uh, managed to rotate uh, the, the nucleus without any uh, hydrodissection, I will go in with my FACO, and I, as you can see, I can see it's a very hard nucleus, brown. I decided uh, to uh, go for divide and conquer, in this case especially, because uh, in this situation, in the place where I was practicing, there was no Neuhin uh, uh, chopper, so I couldn't do a vertical chopping, or so I opted to do uh, the divide and conquer. I'm very, I am very comfortable with the divide and conquer, and I feel always very confident to do a divide and conquer, even in very hard nuclei. As, and I, as you can see, you can see the the, the, the the tongue that you can see is enough power to uh, to create your your gutter, and you can see the. Uh, the, the foamy or, or the, uh, the the foggy uh, material coming out of the uh, emulsification, which means it means also that your power is optimal. And here I've uh, created my cruciate uh, in, uh, gutter, and I will start uh, with the, the division. When I do the division, I try to do as peripheral as possible, and and, I, and as, as you can see, I split the fibers away from each other. Here the gutter was a little bit short. I should have extended it a little bit more to help myself. With the with the division, as you can see, it's 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 resisting division a little bit. So what I will do is 
I will skip it and I will ignore this part. It has uh, uh, divided, but not completely to the center, but I will go and complete my division for the other uh, uh, axis and make sure that, that my division has completed to the center and crossed the center to the other side. As you can see, I can the splitting of the fibers is very obvious at the periphery. And then I make sure that it comes to meet the other splitting. And here I will do the same thing. And I make sure that this, the fibers are splitting. Splitting the fibers is much easier than trying to break the, the, the bonds between them in the center. And now when I'm emulsifying uh, uh, quadrants, I make sure that I chop each quadrant. I'm a little bit out of view here, but I will come back to the view in a, in a second. I don't emulsify large particles. I keep chopping all the time, all the time chopping. As you guess, every time I hold something, I go with the chopper and, and try to emulsify it. I don't leave small particles flying away because these particles would hide from me later on. Every time I hold a quadrant, I will chop it and make sure that it's small quadrants. I'm using very high vacuum with uh, 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 efficient FACO, just releasing FACO with high vacuum and high uh, uh, flow rate to attract particles directly to me. My, uh, my, my FACO is definitely uh, uh, pulsed FACO. Now I'm going to address the, 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 the half that didn't divide, and I'm going to divide it splitting the fibers. As you can see, I'm trying to split the fibers anatomically and chop again one quadrant and chop it into a, a smaller quadrant and then chop it again to a smaller particle and with vacuum and small bursts of FACO, of, of uh, pulsed FACO, it, uh, I emulsify uh, high vacuum as used, as you can see, and chop again. I don't, I don't wait for a large particle to be emulsified. I chop anything I hold, I chop. Well, take it to the center because I'm getting a lot of people now. I take it to the center and vacuum, high vacuum with bursts of FACO or pulses of FACO. I try to uh, 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 make sure that the, uh, my particles are not flying around in, in the anterior chamber or the posterior chamber or in the bag. In cases like this, I have very small uh, uh, epinucleus and very thin uh, cortex. So it's, it's uh, at, at the end of, of uh, my procedure here, I take my flow rate a little bit lower. So as you can see, the, 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 the pieces will stop going in as fast as it used to go before. And I, I moderate my, uh, my vacuum a little bit. Uh, if I have, uh, I take out, you see, when I take out my, my chopper, it's because I want my fluidics to go in a, in a different, uh, like in an efficient way. If my chopper is leaking fluid, then I need to take it out to make sure that the fluidics will bring all the small particles to me. Now the IA is very simple and very easy. No problem with it. And I have completed my surgery. Uh, very minimal uh, power used, high vacuum used, uh, high flow rate, polishing my uh, anterior capsule. I can uh, skip the IA part. And then I will do a simple implantation. I can, I, uh, using, uh, <coughs> sorry. Okay, Dr. Wael, we can. Yeah, we can, uh, we, we can. can discuss. Uh, 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 that's the end of it, right? Yes. Okay, Let's very discuss. well. I know, you, Dr. Uh, you, you prefer a different technique for, uh, for addressing hard nuclei like this. So if you would like to comment on that. Yes, uh, it's a very well done uh, procedure, but the, we have to, I will, I will show just uh, after you the capsular axis and intumescent cataract the way I think it's reproducible also. The spiral way is very good, but we people should uh, know different techniques. Uh, second, we should always address whatever you're doing, uh, the vada and conquer chopping, why you choose different techniques. The idea of the hard cataract is that you want to remove the nucleus with the least power away from the cornea because the, the greatest risk, not only that you can open the procedure, but essentially you're going to insult the endothelium. So the, the less power you use, the better. The more further away from the cornea, working in the procedure chamber, the better and safer to the cornea. Cataract, as Dr. Wyatt showed, this is a different case. 
So I'm going only to focus on the capsular axis. You want it to be reproducible. You want to control the shape and the size of the capsular axis. So you have to analyze what is different in compared to a normal case. Always, if you have a difficult or a different case, convert it to a regular case. So as you can apply your regular rules. And the rules of capsular axis is that you have to have a deep anterior chamber. You move every two clock hours. You uh, hold near the tearing edge and uh, bring always the flap to the center. And to achieve the idea of all these rules that you can control, there are no vector of forces that affects the direction of the tear. So what is different in the intubation capsule? Cap the pressure inside the capsule back is higher. What are the forces acting on the capsule while you are doing capsular axis? Is the pressure coming from the vitreous, pushing anteriorly, and, the, and the, the pressure in the anterior chamber? You always want to equalize both of these uh, factors. So as when you hold the, the capsule, you are the only controlling factor. If the more pressure from behind, then the pressure in the anterior chamber, once you hold the capsule, there will be a vector of forces that will always direct the tear to the equator. And this is one of the reasons if a, in early stages why Argentinian flag sign happens. Because once you open, there is discrepancy in the pressure in front and behind even before you touch the capsule and extend to the equator. So let's see how to disassemble this to convert a more difficult case into a regular case and you can repeat the maneuver each time. Whatever technique you learn, you should be able to reproduce it each single time. So to, you have to fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic. Of course, capsular staining is important. I do it under viscoelastic, massaging under the capsule. Here is the most important step. At the beginning, you make a curved cut. The idea of the curved cut to avoid Argentinian flag sign, if, if you do a, a horizontal cut as you, most of the people will normally do, this gives a chance if there is a gush of fluid from the capsule to make the pressure gradient so the capsule will extend to the equator immediately and the, you will have no control on it. And by this technique, once I puncture, I turn the capsule in a curved manner. So in this way, even if there is a gush of fluid, it will direct the tear in the direction I want. It will be curved. It will never go to the equator. And at the same time, after you go out, once you go out to exchange, you inject viscoelastic and you decompress. This is the second thing. You decompress the bag. What is the difference between this and the normal case? The pressure is high. So first step, I made a curved uh, incision so as not to be surpassed by the high pressure and extension to the equator. Second, I'm going to convert the different situation into a regular situation. The pressure inside is high, so I'm going with the cannula through the open, uh, opening I made to aspirate some of the cortex to decompress the bag. And then injecting viscoelastic to restore the pressure in the anterior chamber holding near the tearing edge and moving as normal. Here, still there is pressure. You can stop, inject viscoelastic, bring the flap to the center, and re-aspirate. The idea, you can re-aspirate as many times as you need to restore the rule. You see, now I'm, everything is in control. I can make it this size. I can make it larger size. There is nothing out of control. So the whole message I want to give here is that how to convert a difficult case that you are afraid something is, is, is sudden happens that will disturb all your plan for the surgery is to convert it in a very reproducible manner. So, uh, Dr. Ware, Dr. Sharif, if you have any comments. I think uh, Dr. Yahya explained in this video, which is an excellent video also, uh, all what is needed to be explained in managing an intumescent cataract, uh, as he mentioned before, uh, you need to uh, keep the anterior chamber under pressure 
so as not to allow the uh, zonules to act on the uh, tearing edge of the anterior capsule and extend your uh, anterior capsule and you will not be able to complete it if this happens. So uh, try to use a viscoelastic that is cohesive and not adhesive. Using uh, uh, helon uh, is better than using uh, hydroxymethyl prepyl uh, cellulose. And uh, I think Dr. Yahya has did a good job in such a case. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Yahya, and I, I, I'm always amazed with your uh, Rexus techniques. And, uh, and, but the, the only thing that I do differently with cases like this is that I go from the side port and uh, 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 as Dr. Sharif said, uh, he, he, he said that we can use the helon. Helon is good when I'm using it with the, from the main uh, incision or the main tunnel. But when I'm using it from the uh, side port, I found that uh, if, I, if I use methyl, methyl is very difficult to leave the anterior chamber from a small uh, incision uh, uh, rather than the, hel the helon. The helon under pressure becomes more fluid, so it can leave. So if I'm using the side port, I take advantage of this and I can inc seriously increase the, uh, the anterior pressure inside the anterior chamber very high and without any leakage from the side port. And I use my cystitone to do the, uh, the, the rexus or the micro rexus portion. Uh, of course, if I'm doing it from the main wound, uh, from the main tunnel, then I will be using uh, a helium uh, with, with uh, hydrostatic. Uh, actually, uh, I, of course, I agree. The idea but just we understand the me mechanics and then you can do it uh, whatever way you want the idea is you understand what where the problem lies and then you can uh, manage accordingly exactly. so it's, it's nice to have different uh, ways of doing the same thing the best the, the mo most important is to be to be reproducible exactly exactly uh, video we can see your video dr Shreef. you can start Unmuted, Dr. Sheep. Uh, unmuted, Dr. Sheep. And I unmuted. Uh, uh, say not muted. Uh, oh, muted. Oh, I unmute you also. I can't unmute him. Dr. Sharif, can you please unmute uh, your uh, your mic? We can't hear you. We can see the video, but we can't hear you. Unmute, unmute. Yes. Is this okay? Uh, uh, now, we can hear, now we can hear you, yes. Okay, I am showing the video now. Uh, this is a case of uh, Salzman nodular and uh, combined with uh, cataract, a cataract patient. Uh, I sometimes resort to removing the opacity manually and there is always a plane of cleavage between uh, the uh, nodular granulomatous tissue and the rest of the cornea. Uh, this uh, would provide after removal both the surgeon and the patient quite a satisfactory vision so you do not have to resort to uh, penetrating keratoplasty in such cases as you can remove uh, almost uh, all of the opacity uh, without doing much harm and much damage to the cornea and uh, you will notice that after I complete removing my uh, nodules uh, uh, that are inducing an opacification in the cornea uh, that the rest of the cornea is quite uh, 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 clear and uh, will allow uh, quite a satisfactory vision uh, uh, after uh, I completely remove them and then proceed with my uh, cataract. Uh, nearly almost uh, all of the opacity now has been removed. <clears throat> it's quite simply actually and it doesn't take much work from the surgeon to remove most of the opacities. Now uh, I'm putting uh, saline on the cornea uh, and viscoelastic to improve uh, visibility while removing the cataract. Uh, I will fast forward the video a little bit so as to uh, see uh, more videos and you will see how the cataract is proceeding. Uh, I'm doing the capsular rexis now. See how clear the cornea became and how I'm uh, performing my surgery with uh, excellent uh, visibility. I use the capsule rexis forceps only to remove, to do my capsule rexis. I do not resort to capsule forceps. Uh, maybe in another session we'll show how this is done. Uh, Hydro dissection is done. And uh, my current technique in phaco emulsification is phaco chop. 
as it, it is much quicker to perform a FECO chop uh, than perform uh, divide and conquer. You simply grasp the nucleus uh, from the peripheral part and then uh, hold the nucleus and try to do your chopping. If the lens is soft, you need to go a little bit deeper to be able to do your chopping. And if it's quite soft, then you, sometimes you don't need to do uh, chopping at all. You can simply remove all of the lens or nucleus uh, without doing much chopping as it is soft and we, you do not uh, require to do much fragmentation uh, uh, in the nucleus. I hardly used my FECO chopper, as, the, as I said before, the uh, nucleus is plus one, maybe plus two maximum. So uh, the amount of chopping that should be done is really quite minimal. The nucleus is removed now and the epinucleus is coming out. Now I am left with only irrigation aspiration and implantation of the intraocular lens. And as you can see, the rest of the cornea is sufficiently clear and you don't need, in some of these cases, to perform uh, uh, sorry, uh, lamellar corneal surgery. This is the irrigation, aspiration, and finally implantation of the uh, polishing of the posterior capsule and implantation of uh, the intraocular uh, lens. Dr. Shif, uh, so Aline, uh, two questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yes. Shif, uh, two questions. Now, Dr. Well, if allowed me. Hi, uh, uh, One. Uh, why did uh, yani first why why did you use the forceps not uh, 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 <coughs> a, a kratom for example or a crescent knife and would you need to do laser prk for example later on and is this type of uh, degeneration recurs or not uh, this is a very good question because uh... Uh, exactly what I do in Trigium, I do with these types of opacities because uh, removing the, uh, the opacity with the forceps allow you to reach the plane without injuring any uh, re uh, left or residual uh, clear cornea. Because if you are, uh, try removing it with a crescent knife, you usually will not reach the plane and you, will, you might cut or usually you cut through clear cornea which induces much uh, astigmatism. But if you remove it with the forceps, uh, the amount of astigmatism induced is really quite minimal and uh, ineffective after the surgery. Okay, and do they recur, this type of degeneration? Yes, sometimes they do recur, mostly they do recur, but it takes quite a few years for them to come back. If they do come back, then you need to do a lamellar cornea surgery. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Well, Munkin, I touch up the, the case similar to the Kamala topic. Okay, okay, Eric. Okay, and then... And I'm going to, yeah, and this is a one, case, one case, of course, we all see different, uh, we, we see different types of uh, corneal opacities with cataract, and then you have to take a decision, what should we uh, do? Uh, so, <clears throat> this is a case of dense uh, corneal opacity uh, with cataract in an old patient coming, seeking improvement of vision. So you have to take decisions. Sometimes you can decide like Dr. Sharif and you deal only with the opacity or you can, with an opacity, you can do the cataract until the patient will see if the vision will improve or not. Sometimes you tell the patient you will need a triple procedure. And in this case, this is a, a stromal opacity, essentially. It's not reaching the endothelium. So I decided that I will prepare a lamellar uh, I will do dark, and I'll see if it is possible to continue on, on, on the, the plane of this membrane and those layer or not. And it's preferable, as you can see, I'm trying to do the uh, dark, injecting the big bubble, not perfect. But still, I can do the dissection. I can do the dissection. And then I would put viscoelastic and see my visualization. The, the, the advantage here, if you are able to do this, that you will do the cataract, you move the cataract in a closed eye, a closed microsurgery. 
and this is extremely much more safer to the patient as compared to doing the surgery in open sky, like in penetrating keratoplasty. So if you can, if you evaluate the patient preoperatively and you see you can do lamellar, it's definitely better. And here I'm showing to you, now I only have this with membrane and do is there. And visualization is completely normal, perfect. And the interesting thing that do is layer and this with membrane will tolerate the high pressure that we have it during uh, fake omensification. So I'm just showing that now you converted the case from a difficult case of visualization to a completely nice cataract case, regular. And I'm just I'm not to waste time doing the regular technique, hydro section, and then fake wood chopping. Everything as normal, the settings are normal. Of course, if you have only uh, this mid membrane alone, it's you know it's much thinner, so you have to be more careful. It's much safer and more tolerable to the to all these maneuvers and the pressure and fluidics in the inside the eye is to have do is layer as well. As you can see here, it's completely as if it is a normal case. So you solve the problem for the patient in a safer way than penetrating keratoplasty. And after you, you remove the, the cataract in a closed microsurgical technique, you implant the intraocular lens and then you look for putting the graft and here, because this is a lamellar surgery, I, I will make use of the graft to, do, to take a DMEC graft as well that I'm going to use in another patient. So the whole idea here is that you should evaluate the opacity, corneal opacity, and decide which is best for the patient. Okay, and then you put the graft. Thank you, Dr. Wael. Oh, very impressive surgery, Dr. Yahya. Very impressive. Very nice surgery. Uh, Dr. Gaba, uh, Dr. Shirin, would you like to comment on that? Actually, I have one comment, Dr. Yahya. You are an excellent surgeon, uh, one of the best surgeons, uh, and uh, I really admire your work. Uh, I only have one question uh, regarding such uh, cases. Uh, why do you prefer uh, to do cataract in combination with DALC, while uh, it's better to do refractive cataract surgery after you remove your sutures? and do proper uh, IOL calculation, or it doesn't make a difference? No, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a valid point. But uh, you want to improve the patient vision as much as possible. And in my opinion, it's then easier to give the patient, the patient improvement because you remove the opacity and remove the cataract. And then you can, if you have a high astigmatism of, or, you, or you, you have a high, a high refractive error, you can decide the best way to correct this refraction. But of course, it can go both ways. But I prefer to solve the whole problem and then deal with the secondary problem. Thank okay. you, Dr. Yah. OK, I will, uh, I will proceed with, the, with my second case. Um, I, will, I will skip this one. This is another uh, hard uh, brown cataract, but I will skip it. It's, uh, uh, and, and let's go for an interesting case. Uh, which is uh, a Morgagnian uh, cataract. Uh, in this case, as we, as you can see, we, uh, I still will do uh, my rexes from the side port, as I always do. Um, the trick here in when I'm injecting my viscoelastic is that I have to go to the other side, inject the viscoelastic to make sure that the anterior chamber is fully filled with viscoelastic and every single uh, uh, part of the aqueous has, has left the anterior chamber. Now I'm going to start uh, with my rexes. All right. Okay. So once I puncture the anterior capsule, as you can see, I get the milky fluid coming out. So what I need to do is aspirate this milky fluid because it will hinder my visualization as, as soon as it starts spreading. And I start aspirating it. Make sure to reduce the pressure inside the, anterior uh, the, inside the capsule. Aspirate more. 
And as I aspirate, I discover that oh, this is going to be fully aspirated. And now we have the, the uh, I'll try to aspirate with a cannula. And once it clears, you can see the surprise. A very, very hard nucleus. Small, very small, no cortex, no epinucleus, nothing. Now my settings for the surgery needs to be changed totally. My perception for, this, for the surgery has to be uh, uh, changed. Now I know that once I start uh, emulsifying the lens, the, the, the posterior capsule is going to be directly uh, uh, in front of my, uh, my pico tip. The rexes. Now I want to do my rexes from the side port and I'm going to use my cystitome. How can I use my cystitome when I'm in, in parts there is no uh, actual uh, integrity under the, the, the anterior capsule? The, the, the lens mat matter is like high in the, in the center of the, the nucleus, low in the periphery, and the nucleus is moving with me. So this is not giving me the, 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 the reproduce, like the, the, the stability of conditions that I use with my cystitome from the side port. So now I will uh, 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 go for a uh, rexus forceps from the main tunnel, I create a main wound, and I start using my rexus forceps from the main tunnel. I still use the shearing method. My, my flap is constantly moving in the direction where my rexis is going to be. I put the flap on the anterior chamber all the time, on, on the anterior capsule, I mean, all the time. Take the flap central. As you can see, the rexis forcep is not the best in the world. And now I have my rexis. It's a small rexis, but it's a good uh, 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 continuous rexis. And now I, I'm filling inside the bag with uh, viscoelastic. I'm injecting viscoelastic behind the uh, the, the, the nucleus, the very small nucleus, and as you can see, it's a small nucleus, but it's very hard. Now, my settings uh, uh, are going to change from a normal uh, 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 hard phaco uh, case. What I will do, I will do uh, horizontal chopping or transverse chopping, horizontal chopping, but I will not, I'll, I'm very scared, I don't know the, the thickness of the nucleus. So I'm trying to appreciate how thick the nucleus is. The first chop, I, I found out it's not uh, uh, enough. So I go into a different place and I try to appreciate the thickness of the nucleus. I don't know if my phaco tip will penetrate or not. So I'm still trying to appreciate the thickness. Now when I chop, I can see how thick the nucleus is. So I can adjust how much I bury and how much vacuum I can use to bury in myself inside the nucleus. Now I can see the thickness of my nucleus. So now my chopping is better. I don't start uh, 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 emulsifying uh, the, the, the nucleus fragments that I, uh, I chop. I chop all the, uh, the quadrants. I keep chopping and keeping my nucleus, protecting my posterior capsule until I manage to uh, chop the whole nucleus into small pieces. And then I start em emulsifying it. In this way, I, I maintain the posterior capsule away from my uh, pico tip all the time. And uh, in my setting, I will, I will show at the end of the surgery how I change in the setting. I change in the, uh, uh, the rise time, uh, uh, the dynamic rise. I change the dynamic rise to a minus dynamic rise. So when I have an occlusion, my flow rate becomes less. I, I take my flow rate down when I have an occlusion. When I don't have an occlusion, I can have a flow rate that will let the, the lens fragments come to my uh, my, my, my pico tip. So now that uh, I'm, uh, I have managed to uh, chop as much as possible from the nucleus, everything is clearing up slowly, but clearing up uh, 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 quite well. I chop in the direction of the fibers, and I make sure that the, the chopping reaches the center of the nucleus. I got a little bit out of the field here of the camera, but I can see in the microscope. So as you can see, once I get a, a, a hold of the nucleus, my flow rate drops 
by uh, at least 25% uh, or 50%. And that means that uh, I will not, if, if I uh, emulsify the, the, that fragment of the nucleus, uh, after I release my, uh, my, block, my blockage of the tip, I don't get a surge, and I don't get a rush of the procedure capsule towards my, uh, my tip. And still, you will see here, try to look at the tip and the posterior capsule, you will see a, a, a very evident sign in a minute. And there you see, see it. This uh, nucleus, as, it, uh, as I finish the last bit of nucleus, you will see a spider, spider legs appearing. That means that I'm going to get my capsule entangled in my phaco tip. The patient is moving, so I take out my, uh, my phaco tip quickly. And then, and my chopper, the main power to take out is the chopper. I can keep my fake tip, but the chopper has to go out quickly. And now I do my, la my last chop. And I want you to see the spider legs that we, this is very, going to be very obvious. I'm very careful. You see the spider legs again, spider legs and release. Did you see it? It it's very happen. obvious. Oh, obvious. It will happen again. Uh, spider web, again. web, web. Spider legs again. Web. Oh, or webs, yes. Sorry, it was spider web or spider legs. And still the posterior capsule is intact. How, how do we achieve this? I will show you on the settings of my FACO machine. How do I achieve that uh, I change my flow rate as uh, I finish my, uh, uh, my FACO? Uh, if, you are, if my colleagues would allow me, I will, uh, I will change my screen right now to the uh, PECO machine. So uh, I, I'm very comfortable working with the, with the Infinity machine. Uh, this is the dynamic rise. The dynamic rise, when it's zero, it means that your uh, aspiration rate is whatever you have here. But when I change it to minus one, it means that when, I, when my, my FECO tip is blocked, by uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, fragments, my aspiration rate will go down by 25%. If I change it to minus two, that means that my aspiration rate will go down by 50%, which will take me to 22, almost 22, okay? If I'm afraid that I'm gonna entangle the posterior capsule in the tip, like what happened with me, I will not use torsional, because torsional fake group, uh, um, it shreds the posterior capsule once it, uh, it holds it. So I will go and make myself with longitudinal FACO because it's more forgiving. It doesn't mean that the longitudinal FACO will, uh, will not rupture your posterior capsule if you continue months fine. But it, I mean, if, in the, if, if I got entangled like uh, the, the, the time I did now with a, a, a torsional FACO, this means that I, might, I have a higher uh, liability to, uh, to get the uh, Posterior capsular uh, rupture, and uh, that concludes this uh, surgery. Excellent, Sergi Turwell, and Andy. Just a comment, uh, if, you, if you allow me. Yeah, uh, please. Uh, one, of course, it's uh, typical of uh, Morgagni cataract. You have this fluid coming out, and then you have the problem of capsular excess, and then the problem of the the nucleus that you perfectly dealt with. Number one. I would uh, inject the viscoelastic as you, like you did, but earlier. Yeah, once you puncture, actually, the capsular axis itself, it's difficult without the support. So you fill the bag with viscoelastic, and if you have even helium and helium GV, then you will fill the bag and do the axis almost in a normal way, because it is difficult to, to work on it without support, as you should. Second, in hard cataracts, I would prefer to expose the tip a little bit more than you exposed it. So as you can embed better. Uh, well, that's the point. I was a little bit afraid. I didn't know the thickness of the nucleus. I it, thought it, it, it might be very thin. So if I embed, I would, I would uh, uh, perforate and go to the other side. That was my concern yes. at the time. But I, yes. I, you're right. Once I, I, I appreciated how it, uh, the thickness was, I could have... Uh, uh, and, and, and the third thing uh, I just want to point is what you said about the machine settings is uh, it's perfect and uh, every machine has its any clues 
But the most important thing is exactly what you did, that you saw the web. Exactly. If you didn't see it, then whatever settings you are putting will not save you from rupturing the capsule because the rupture will happen from a mechanical catch of the capsule. So the, the message here, more than the settings, is that you are careful and you are looking and you saw that you catch the capsule so you managed accordingly. You let go, think, you didn't I pull think, out. I think this is the, a the, very important. The, the, the key here was I was looking for it rather than uh, 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 seeing it. I was and, looking for it when it will happen. And this is perfect. Constantly yeah, all the time waiting for this to happen. Perfect. Dr. Shreve Gamal, do you have a question? I have one question, and after I ask my question and you answer, please, uh, I, I would like to give some time to answer some of the audience questions, uh, because I see some of the, our colleagues have raised uh, their hands. Uh, why did you use divide and conquer? It's a tricky question, and you prefer to do chopping in such a case. Divide and conquer uh, uh, is, is a technique that, uh, that relies on the stability of the nuclei. If I have a weak zinule, then I prefer not to do uh, divide and conquer. If, I, if this nucleus is going to be moving left and right inside the bag, it's a, it's a small nucleus, my, my only chance is to grab it, hold it, and then chop it. If I start doing divide and start sculpting, it's going to be running left and right in front of me. I, I'm not going to be able to do I I don't think I, I'm going to be able to do uh, divide and conquer. Exactly. Uh, a moving nucleus is very hard to do divide and conquer is. So you need to have a stable, non-moving nucleus in order to do divide and conquer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wayne. Dr. Shreef, uh, your case, what to, to present? Would you like to take some questions? Well, we only have one hand raised. Let's take questions at the end. I think it will be much more beneficial. Okay. Because they can see all the cases and they can discuss them. And, and, and you can share, Dr. Shreef, even if you see a Dr. Sharif, uh, a question, you can answer it without interrupting our, and you can answer it. If you while see okay. a question in uh, the chat, yes. If you see a question uh, in the chat, you can answer. Okay. Uh, my next case, I'm going to show an interesting uh, video on fake or snare. Uh, <coughs> this is an alternative technique in order to remove the cataractus lens uh, through uh, a sutureless incision uh, without the use of uh, frequent modification. And uh, actually this snare, we, uh, I think it was first introduced in India, and we adopted uh, this technique in some of our cases. Uh, in order to uh, do, uh, and uh, 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 to reduce the astigmatism in such cases, we prefer to use a scleral tunnel uh, which allows us to enlarge uh, our incision uh, and not induce uh, much astigmatism uh, post-operatively. And then we perform a scleral tunnel incision. Uh, I'm going to uh, increase the speed of the video. The scleral tunnel incision has to be uh, about uh, two to three millimeter in depth through clear corneal tissue and as wide as you see fit in order to remove your lens fragments after you perform your uh, fecal snare. Uh, here I'm doing my lamellar uh, tunnel incision, which would be around uh, uh, five millimeter in uh, diameter. Uh, after this, I'm going to uh, enter the anterior chamber and perform my uh, capsular axis. <coughs> Here I am performing and completing my capsular axis. As I mentioned before, I prefer to use my capsular axis faucets. And in large, such case, large uh, capsular axis? Yes, you prefer to do a large capsular axis in phaco snare in order to successfully perform your phaco snare. And then you do a hydro dissection, uh, which is important in order to expose the equator of the nucleus. It has to uh, 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 be uh, enough to. Uh, introduce the edge of the nucleus inside the anterior chamber to allow the fecal snare to engage uh, the equator of this nucleus and uh, be performed uh, successfully. Now I'm going to uh, introduce my fecal snare and then engage 
you see uh, part of the snail is behind the nucleus and the other part is in front of the nucleus and then you pull uh, the snare and it will cut through the nucleus and this is by simple pressure on the posterior lip of the wound the uh, portion that you have cut will uh, come out quite smoothly and then you rotate the nucleus in order to again introduce your uh, snare and perform another cut Again, I introduced my fecal snare once again in order to cut the remaining uh, nucleus into two portions, which again I'm going to pull out through the posterior lip of the wound. You have to inject viscoelastic beneath the nucleus in order to raise the intraocular pressure to allow for the delivery of the uh, lens fragment. And again, by visco expression, the rest of the nucleus can uh, quite easily be expressed. And you successfully remove all of the nucleus fragments from within the eye. I'm showing here the nucleus fragments that has been removed. Once you get used to this technique, it's really quite simple and it's quite safe. And there is no uh, phaco energy inside the eye. so. Dr. Shreve, I see in the timeline it's taking my, you are no, you are a FACO surgeon that finishes in five minutes. This is taking like 13 minutes. Why, why uh, would you choose to do this? Uh, actually, the FACO snare, when you do it uh, manually at the operating theater, it's, uh, it takes some time to, to, to fix it. And this is the, actually what took the time, not the actual uh, surgery by itself. Finally, you perform irrigation aspiration. And uh, scleral tunnel techniques, I've been performing quite a, a number of such cases, and uh, they uh, nearly induce uh, no astigmatism postoperatively as the incision is in. in, in uh, inside the sclera and uh, the rest of the wound is uh, performed in a lamellar fashion in the cornea which acts exactly as the laser or lasik flaps so it induces uh, minimal or no astigmatism at all very interesting uh, dr well what's your comment it's a very interesting case. Uh, um, uh, I, I would I would li like to uh, 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 ask when do you uh, opt for using this technique rather than uh, fake? Because I can see you're using the fake machine. So when do you choose to do this technique? Uh, and no, I'm using the fake machine only in irrigation aspiration. Okay. So, so which you can use the double way. Uh, of course. Yes, but uh, it's quite faster to use the fake machine. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we have the people asking questions like, uh, is it, is it uh, the risk or for the uh, endothelium? Do you have any risk for endothelium damage? With we performed the uh, endothelial uh, cell count in such cases and there was nearly minimal or no endothelial cell loss. Okay. Uh, one person was asking about uh, the, uh, the case I, I presented. He was asking, uh, uh, if I inject viscoelastic and prolapse the nucleus to the anterior chamber, well, why would I, uh, why would I want to prolapse the, the nucleus into the anterior chamber and emulsify it in the anterior chamber when it's, uh, it's as you can see, it's a morgagnian. It means that uh, this is an old person. It means that his endothelium is definitely not as the healthiest. I don't want to, and it's a brown nucleus. It's not a, a, an easy uh, procedure. So I don't want to emulsify next and near the, 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 the cornea. I want to stay away from the cornea as much as possible. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, can we proceed to, uh, to another case? Uh, uh, the, 
Well, we will move to uh, another uh, يعني, uh, scenario. Still, we have different scenarios. One is this. Uh, it's a case, a child that did cataract surgery like two years earlier, and he came with capsular phimosis and displaced IOL. So uh, this is one way of thinking how to deal with the problem. So... So we can see the problem here is that uh, the whole lens, this is the zonules and the edge of the capsule. The capsular axis is actually here. Dr. Well, is it obvious for everybody? Yes, you can see it. Yes. The, the, so it's, and this is disturbing vision for the patient. So uh, uh, the plan was, we try to really release the, the, the capsule if possible, but obviously it was not possible to salvage the whole capsule. So from the beginning, I was planning that at least I'm going to uh, put uh, use the Yamani technique to fixate the lens, as luckily this lens was a three-piece lens. So I planned for this from the beginning, the, the marking for the Yamani, it's clear fixation and to see what unfolds during the surgery. Always make a plan and then see what happens during surgery and then you decide if you are going to change it or not. Okay, so now I'm trying to deal with the capsule, with the lens to see what's happening. The lens actually is put in the sulcus and the whole capsule is crumpled behind. So the plan is now I have يعني, to just make, to clarify things. This lens is actually in the sulcus. The whole capsule with the phimose is pulled down here and fibrosed and wrinkled, bisecting the center. So the decision now, I said, I will fix the lens first and then deal with the capsule which is present behind the lens. To have at least support, not to lose the capsule first and then while trying to fix the lens, I can lose it. This is a 27 gauge needed going into the tunnel. This is the haptic here with a forceps, 23 gauge forceps from the paracentesis. I will feed this haptic into the bore of the needle. And then we'll come out from the tunnel that I already made. This is the haptic. The second haptic, now I'm dealing with the second haptic. It's obvious for me now that I cannot keep this capsule. So I'm going to repeat the maneuver for the second haptic. Feed it into the bore of the needle. Look, the haptic here is out, the first haptic with a good length. And then with both hands, you start centering the lens and you deliver the haptic here outside of the sclera and conjunctiva. Now, by manually manipulating the lens in position, so now I, I, the lens is secure. You could rise to make an op so as not to have this tip 
slipping back again inside the sclera tip and to be able to embed it in the sclera tunnel. So now the situation is the lens is properly fixed but still have the phimosis. The phimosis and the capsular displacement. So now with the needle, through a paracentesis, I just made an opening to be easier for the ocutome to cut it. And now I'm removing all the zinules here and the opacified capsular bag and fibrosis capsular bag to allow for a clear visual access. So in a step manner, the problem for the patient is so solved. This is the way I saw it for this patient. This was the best technique. But of course, we will see other opinions from the, from the panel. Thank you, Dr. Sharif or Dr. Wael. Uh, in my point of view, this is an excellent surgery and I would not have done uh, other than what you did, Dr. Yahya. Uh, an excellent procedure with excellent results. Uh, Dr. Yahya, in the Yemeni technique, do you prefer to extract the, the, the first haptic uh, all the way outside the globe and then uh, try to uh, uh, manipulate the other one into the needle? Or do you prefer to do like other surgeons, some surgeons I've seen them, they leave the, the tip of the needle inside the globe with the first haptic engaged inside it so it gives them more space to manipulate the second haptic. Of course, but say in this case in particular, it is different because the lens was already inside. So it was a little bit easier to manipulate. You don't uh, talk about uh, leading haptic and trailing haptic. Exactly. exactly. So exactly. one of the tricks also is how you direct to direct uh, the, <coughs> the tip of the needle. You can even, if for, the, for example, for the second haptic, you can curve it, uh, rotate it just to be easier to feed it into the bore. But I it, think, it, it, sorry. That's an excellent but, hint. That's an excellent I have hint. a small comment uh, to Dr. Weil that uh, removing the lens and reintroducing it, uh, Dr. Weil will, uh, uh, will all allow the anterior chamber to be open through a large incision uh, which will induce much astigmatism. This is the first uh, uh, part. And the second is that uh, while you are uh, maneuvering the leading haptic and the training haptics through a large incision, you, you sometimes almost always end with some hypotony and distortion in the uh, visibility, which uh, makes the procedure more difficult. Uh, Dr. Yahya uh, managed the uh, case perfectly. Oh, uh, no, I didn't I mean to, 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 to expect the IOL. I, don't know. I didn't mean to expect the IOL, but I, I thought uh, that uh, uh, yeah, there's a different technique for the, the uh, leaving the, the, the needle inside the eye. So he, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fair, uh, fair uh, uh, yeah, reason. You have a point, of course. You have a point. Excellent. Reason for, for leaving. Okay, uh, I will present now a case. I will still skip one case, and I'm going to present this one. As we were talking about the Argentinian uh, tears, uh, this is a case for a patient that, uh, let me see his data. Um, just one second. So this is a patient who was a 34 years uh, old man. He has a history of trauma four months ago. He had traumatic cataract with vitreous hemorrhage and RD. His vision is PL, back projection. Okay, so this patient was coming in for phaco vitrectomy. Uh, what I did here is I did exactly what I do all the time. I went from the side port. I injected a methyl inside the anterior chamber and the anterior chamber was very deep. So I assumed I'm giving enough pressure in front of the uh, anterior capsule that will equalize any pressure inside uh, intracapsular pressure. I started trying to do a, a rounded incision as Dr. Yahya said, but it just didn't work. Look, at, look again. Once I punctured, I tried to make my puncture a curved one, but my curving just took it all the way and it just 
uh, rupture. I want to stop here. Sorry. Uh, I want to stop at this, po uh, this point and, uh, and elaborate why did this happen to me. Um, I have my trokers inside. The globe is soft. So uh, I had uh, the, the vitreous has uh, probably when I was doing my, my the infusion was on your toilet. Sorry, no, it was not on. Infusion on? Yeah, the 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 the, 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 the irrigation uh, port was not open, and I think with, this is the explanation I got because I had a very deep uh, anterior chamber. What I did is I I I pushed in the uh, the, the viscoelastic, but because the vitreous size was not the, the vitreous has like leaked or like i had a, hypo, a posterior hypotony so what happened is the whole nucleus the whole lens was pushed to the back and there was stress on the zinnules rather than equalizing the pressure inside uh, inside and outside the the lens so the pressure inside the lens was still high the ac was very deep but it's it, i i didn't have the support of the posterior vitreous space that will give me higher pressure inside the anterior chamber and that's why once I opened the anterior capsule, still the anterior pressure, uh, uh, chamber pressure was very low compared to the, in, uh, uh, the intracapsular pressure. And that's why it burst. Uh, at this point, Dr. Yahya, I, I, yani my advice to everybody, don't, do not mm -hmm. proceed with FACO. I, I was already uh, performing vitrectomy and RD. So I, was, I had all my setting to go in, uh, backwards. So I didn't have a problem. I didn't have anything to lose. So I continued my surgery. I, uh, I, I think I, okay. I think I, uh, all right. I think I lost my presentation. It's going to be, uh, okay. Can, can we go with uh, someone else do a, another case until my uh, Oh, but so we can, we can uh, just discuss and we'll discuss this. So the, uh, the, the cut, yeah. There is a pressure gradient, and in my opinion, you did the, the, the anterior chamber was not well formed to oppose the pressure in the back, and the curve was not enough. That's why you, you pulled out a little bit faster to give time to the fluid to gush out and then do the Argentinian flake. If you curve it a little faster, yeah, you don't go out and curve you. You curve while you are inside. This would have prevented this, uh, I'm sure, if particularly if you fill the anterior chamber uh, with viscoelastic yeah, and the you already was, was extremely deep. Was extremely uh, it's deep. It's not I, okay, but it's, it's not deep. enough. But the point, the, the, the thing that I, I assumed is the, the the vitreous has leaked from the uh, the chokers when I was uh, introducing them. So the pressure in the vitreous was low. So that's why the, the whole lens was being pushed backwards rather than elevating the, the, the pressure inside the anterior chamber. Okay, it's a good yani, uh, theory. Dr. Shif Gamal, do you have a comment? Or do you want to tell us about the... I'm presenting a nice video with a patient who underwent uh, fakic IOL implantation. Uh, it's not the typical ICL, it's an Indian-made uh, uh, type of uh, ICL and uh, so uh, but actually the result was that uh, a cataract was induced in such a patient. How after, long after the surgery? After the surgery. How, how uh, long after the surgery? Uh, it took him uh, one month after the surgery to develop oh. the cataract and uh, he com complained of diminution of vision so I decided to put out, pull out the intraocular lens and perform a classic regular fecal modification. This is IPCL. Uh, because of the, the lens being so thin, uh, you can actually uh, uh, pull out this lens uh, as a whole through a fecal incision, a regular fecal incision, uh, but you have to uh, deliver the lens into the anterior chamber by some manual manipulations. Uh, I used a uh, Iris repository in order to manipulate my uh, lens and uh, deliver this lens at least uh, the part of the haptic optic into the anterior chamber and this allowed me to grasp this lens and pull it out uh, through the same incision without hindering the integrity of my incision or increasing its uh, length. Uh, 
it's better to uh, prolapse uh, most of the nucleus and most of the lens in order to grasp it. And you simply uh, try to grasp it with the two forceps. Uh, is, it thicker, is it thicker than the normal ICL, the actual yes, the original ICL? Yes, actually it is. But it's still quite thin. And it uh, actually, uh, part of it is torn here while I try to grasp it. So I'm trying to uh, grasp it from the center as much as possible in order to have a, a strong grasp on it. And as you can see here, it's being pulled out through the same incision. I'm showing the lens here. Part of it is torn, of course, uh, due to the previous cut. And uh, the whole lens came out through this small incision. And this will allow me to perform uh, safely my regular uh, fake emulsification. Uh, there is a peripheral iridectomy that was made here because uh, of the previous surgery. Uh, you, you might encounter some uh, meiosis in such cases because of the trauma uh, that resulted from manipulating the uh, fakic IOL, uh, but you can always uh, use uh, uh, adrenaline uh, through your drip or you can use viscoelastic to uh, redilate your pupil uh, once again and rely on the uh, fluidics and the pressure of the fluid that's entering the eye in order to maintain this uh, dilated uh, pupil. Uh, the rest of the procedure is more or less uh, the typical cataract procedure and the nucleus here is quite soft so I do not e uh, need to use a chopper in order to remove this uh, quite soft uh, cataract as the patient is quite young. Uh, and then we remove the uh, cortical material and finally uh, implanting uh, my uh, intraocular lens and cleaning up the residual viscoelastic. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so, so this is the Indian ICL, uh, Dr. Sharif, right? Yes, yes, yes unfortunately. They're, they're, they're very notorious and they're, uh, they're acrylic, actually not, uh, uh, not, not yes, collimer. ICL yes. Uh, collimer. So that's why this they're very good. notorious with the... Uh, with, uh, okay, Dr. Yeah. Sheep, do you think the cataract is uh, surgically induced or due to the lens, the bolt, or, for example, or what? No, I believe it's because of the lens, Dr. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not sure, of course but it is probably because of the lens because it took some time uh, but maybe the surgeon did some trauma to the lens to the to the natural lens while he tried to implant and this might also result in uh, cataract formation okay uh, can i uh, just finish my video with the uh, with the, the face that i was showing okay enter enter boss and i had to tell you something <laughs> yeah, but, uh, Besides okay. already uh, how to proceed uh, in a case like this, uh, I, I started uh, uh, making my edges rounded, uh, making small tears in the in the capsule and taking uh, like uh, rounded edges so I can have a, a space to to go in with my feku. Uh, I took in the in the first half and the second half. And now I can see this is a traumatic cataract in a young patient, in a young a young man. Uh, I don't need a lot of phaco, uh, but I don't need a lot of fluidics. I don't need a, a very high bottle. I don't need a, a high uh, chlorate. I don't need a very high vacuum. All I need is good fluidics flowing in without a lot of turbidity and vacuum doing the whole uh, job. Uh, as you can see, it's a very easy procedure. Uh, Vacuum will uh, finish everything uh, just with fluidics, no uh, FACO at all uh, used. And uh, had this uh, been properly uh, managed from the beginning, I, if I managed to uh, equalize the pressure between the intracapsular and the anterior chamber, uh, things would have uh, looked different. Uh, we're going to go with the simple polishing to the anterior and posterior capsule so we can uh, enhance the visualization during the vitrectomy. And as you can see, magnification, as always, Dr. Yahya would always say, magnification is the key mm -hmm. to a successful surgery. And now I implant my, uh, my lens. I'm very careful with my lens. Uh, I, I, I have increased the, uh, the access opening, for, uh, especially for the implantation, rather than just the phaco. And now I implanted intra-bagel uh, uh, IOL. 
still, I'm very confident uh, uh, with my surgery because I know if anything happens, I'm, uh, I'm already, I have access to the pituitary segment. I can go and get any nucleus that drops. I can go and get any uh, IOL that can drops from them. Okay, uh, now uh, I think Dr. Yahya would uh, like to give uh, your case. Sorry. Okay, let's move to another uh, complicated case, our extreme case. This is a case of traumatic uh, subluxation, and this is how. Dr. Yahya, you didn't share your screen yet. Okay. Okay, shared yes. now, right. we, now we can see your screen, yes. Well, yes, we can see it. Okay, so this is <clears throat> interesting case. I just want this is a traumatic. Traumatic. The lens is subluxated, clearly subluxated. You can see the folds in the anterior capsule, and you can see the edge of the. You can see the edge of the capsule is almost 180 degrees. So you have to be very careful. Use viscoelastic all the time to make a small but wide enough capsular access. Here I'm going to use the iris hooks, although now I don't prefer to use it to hold the capsule. You will see why afterwards. The, be the best is to use capsular hooks because they are longer and more blunt. Now I'm doing my regular FACO chop. And now you can see why the, the capsular hooks are not the Iris hooks are not the best because they are a little bit sharp and short. You can actually tear the capsule, so you have to be extremely careful. And this is what happened. You can see here a tear in the capsule. And there is vitreous coming from the zonular area. So you have to remove it to allow the, the lens, uh, the, the back to be centered. You can see the tear, it's a big, big tear. And, and once you have an open capsule, you cannot put a capsule tension ring. So I decided to do a clearer fixation, one haptic scale fixation, because this is traumatic subluxation. It is not a progressive pathology. So at the area of subluxation, whereas the nules are deficient, I'm going to fix the lens. And then after fixing the lens, I'm going to uh, do a redoplasty because this is a, a, this case had traumatic uh, uh, medrases. So the message here is that you should not use capsular hook, uh, uh, iris hooks. You should not use iris hooks to support the the capsule in cases of subluxation because they carry more risk and they are not as efficient as the capsular hooks which are longer and uh, blunt and then as you saw the plan changed i was planning at the beginning to implant a capsule tension ring and then a lens in the bag but the plan changed because the capsule tear so i cannot implant a lens a capsule tensioning in the capsular bag, and that's why I opted to at least fix one haptic to the sclera to make sure that the lens will stay stable, and then sutured the iris because this was a secondary effect of the trauma. Dr. Sharif, would you like to present the case? Dr. Sharif? Okay. Uh, um... I, I... Do you have another case, Dr. Well? I have a case uh, of a traumatic subluxation also. So let's, uh, I was going to present something uh, also, Feku, detract to me, but let's make it for the next, uh, uh, the next one. 
I will go for one uh, to, just to match the, the mood. So let's go for uh, this case is a traumatic subluxation also. Uh, in, in this case, I uh, uh, still I do my rexes from the side port. Uh, I find doing the rexes from the side port, as I said, anatomical with my hand. As I move my hand, uh, it, it's more, uh, I get more comfortable with it. Uh, I do a shearing uh, movement all the time. My, uh, my capsule is on top of my anterior, my, my flap is on top of my anterior capsule. And it's slowly and rounded. Uh, as you can see, we have almost uh, 160, 140 degrees of uh, zonular uh, dialysis or dehiscence. Uh, the Rex is, is finished smoothly and nicely. And now I'm faced with, uh, with, with the choice. Do I take a chance and do my, uh, my FECU uh, and lose more zinules and then become, uh, uh, lose the ability to do the, the, to put a CTR or should I put it in the beginning? And I decided to put my CTR at the very beginning. Now I'm gonna show some signs that are very critical when you put your CTR at the very beginning. First, you will need to put the CTR directly, directly under the anterior capsule. And here you can see the corrugations that you have seen here at the surface. It means that you are directly under the anterior capsule. Look, when I start pushing my capsule, you will see a very nice sign, which is a clear zone between the lens matter and the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the end of the uh, capsule or the capsule attention ring. So as I push slowly, progressively, uh, feeding one hand to the other, like shaking hands, as you can see, do you see this, this empty space? It tells you that this capsule tension ring is outside the cortical material, which is a very good thing. This is something that you want. So you don't have a problem with the cortical material when you are doing the aspiration, uh, the irrigation aspiration, okay? As you can see here, you can see that it's catching more cortical material. So when you release it here, now you have this sign here, but you don't have the same sign on this side. So you can expect at the end of the surgery, during the uh, uh, irrigation aspiration, you're gonna have problems here, you're not gonna have problems on the other <coughs> side. So I do my hydro section, my hydro delineation, it's very important. I, I, every, every time I'm, I'm pushing the nucleus back to its normal position, these are the, 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 the pressure is distributed on all the zinules on this side, okay? If, if any pressure to the others, if I'm pressing to the other side, I will be uh, uh, making pressure on the zinules on the end, uh, the end of the, 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 the dehiscence. Now I decided I'm going to do uh, uh, divide and conquer with minimal rotation. So I'm not going to rotate the, the nucleus as much as I can. I'm doing uh, a very high phaco here because I don't want to, uh, to be pushing and moving the, the nucleus. It's preferred that I would do uh, uh, vertical chopping in cases of uh, zonular dialysis, uh, but you need to have the proper instrumentation for that. I didn't have instruments that are good for a vertical chopping. So I decided to do uh, the divide and conquer, the, the technique that I'm more comfortable with and it's reproducible with me. As you can see, I, I divide from the very peripheral part of the nucleus. And now my division is completed. I will, I will make sure that it, uh, the division uh, passes all the way to the other side. I'm trying to pass my division to the other side. I'm extending it to the other side and doing minimal rotation. Then I'm going to do uh, another quadrant deep enough and then go, go to the periphery and then divide. And then now I'm not going to do any more rotation and I'm going to take this quadrant and take it out. And because I did hydro delineation, so I don't have any load. So the nucleus comes out easily for me. It's very easy now. And with high vacuum, I can finish it. Now I'm trying to get the rest of the nucleus. I, I, I make my, I complete my division totally. Now the nucleus is moving inside the bag. It's not dragging the bag with it. It's moving inside the bag. And, I, and now I'm doing the, the ch chopping. And so the trick here is I don't want to do high resistance 
uh, rotation while the whole nucleus is there. Once I have fragments out, the rotation is inside the bag without any friction on the bag. So it doesn't exert pressure on the zinules, uh, a rotational or tor uh, torque pressure on the zinules and tear them uh, uh, more. And that pressure is always distributed on the, all the zinules that are not torn. And that's because of the capsular tensioning that I have. As you can see, the rotation is very easy because uh, there is, there is, uh, it's, a, it's a small part of the nucleus, not the whole nucleus. Now I'm doing the chopping again, not relying on the divide and conquer anymore. I'm doing chopping. As you can see, the flow rate is not too high. I'm, I'm using 30 uh, flow rate, 30 millimeters per minute. And I finish my, uh, my, uh, my nucleus. And then as you can see, the bag is stable, but the epinucleus wants to come. And that's easy. I take out my, my, uh, my side uh, port uh, instrument to, ma to make sure that the fluidics are tightly uh, moving towards the FICO tip and nothing is leaking. And as you can see, the, the, the epinucleus is coming to me easily, very easily, no problem. And the, the bag is stable in its place. You can see the bag is totally stable. And now I'm going to start my IA. And you can, I will show in the, in the irrigation aspiration what happens uh, when I start the irrigation aspiration. I will not have any problem with the side that I had the positive sign I was looking for. As you can see, I go and IA is easy and no problem. It, the, the lens material comes out, the cortex is coming out very easy. No problem, as you can see, it's no, no uh, uh, pulling, no uh, resistance, no dragging. And then you will see on the other side, I'm very happy with this now and I'm, I'm really excited about it and I'm, uh, I'm hoping that this is, the, the other sign is not gonna be, but you can see, when I come to this side, now you can see that the lens material, see, here the lens material is coming very easy. But on this side, now you can see that the lens material is captured in the, uh, uh, capsular tension ring. And this is what, you have to do a side movement. It's like more a tangential movement to remove them. You don't pull to the center, you're more going tangential movement to remove those uh, uh, lens material. So uh, you don't exert a, a central pulling. Uh, if you pull central, it means you're exerting on the zinules here and here, very high pressure on those zinules. So you go and, and do tangential, tangential to release it from it. As you can see, these lens material are behind the uh, capsular tension ring. And this is what people don't, why people don't prefer to put the uh, capsular tension ring at the beginning. You are always faced with two choices, either to put it uh, at the middle of the surgery or at the end of the surgery or at the beginning of the surgery. At the beginning of the surgery, you are making sure that uh, you don't lose the zinules and you don't reach a, a stage of the surgery where you cannot put your, uh, your capsular tension ring. It gives you uh, more uh, of, a, of a confidence in your surgery. But as you can see, you are faced with uh, uh, lens matter that is uh, entrapped in the capsular tension ring. But if you follow the rules as we did at, uh, at, the, at the, uh, the, this half, uh, the right half of the, of it, of the, of the introduction, it was, it was very easy and, and the lens material came out. So we're only having one third of the uh, cortical material captured in the, uh, the capsular tension ring. And now we're done. Uh, I think I implant my lens. It's very uh, simple and centralized. This is my IOL. Uh, fixing the globe from the side port and directly leading my uh, IOL inside the bag. And as you can see, lens inside the bag. I'm going to use the main tunnel to, uh, to manipulate it. So, uh, and uh, that's it. Uh, the trailing haptic is going in easily and softly. And this is the rexes, and that's the case. Dr. Yehi, would you like to comment on this case? Uh, <clears throat> very nice, Dr. Well. As I want to uh, ask you, uh, infusion, how, uh, how, uh, how was your infusion height? My infusion height, I don't like to use a very high infusion. And if I take my infusion, I'm using like the 75 or 80. And, uh, and uh, if I take my infusion down, I, I, I also take down my, uh, my aspiration rate. So I wouldn't this have is, surgery. 
very important uh, in these cases you want low infusion and everything is going slow uh, like a slow motion surgery yeah. and uh, you can uh, as a rule so dr well chose uh, to be safer from the beginning but as a rule the late the later you can put the capsule tensioning the better and you can postpone the capsule tensioning until you, you, are, you really have to put it this facilitates uh, the surgery but of course dr well did an excellent job and the trick he talked about where he is placing the the ring was very helpful during the surgery. So excellent uh, job, Dr. Wade. Thank you, Dr. Wade. Thank you. So Shreep, nice, Dr. Wade, very nice surgery and uh, very well finished. Uh, but I have an interesting question. Are you left-handed? Yes, I yes. am left-handed, yes. <laughs> and it, it was a very big problem to my students at the beginning. And then I, I started uh, performing with my right hand. So now I can perform surgery with left hand and right hand. I can perform with both hands, no problem. But if I'm uh, uh, doing my own surgeries, I'm always with my left hand. Because you are performing all of your exercises from the left side. So it's yes, impossible to do that yes, I am with the right hand. <laughs> Dr. Shif, is it the case of the short axial lens? Or which case you want to show us? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, this is very interesting uh, case that uh, يعني, we might see it and we need to have a decision in it. And should we do it or not? Dr. Sheep, share a screen now. This is a nice, interesting case of uh, a case of microphthalmus. Uh, IOL power calculation was. Uh, 30 diopters, and uh, we don't have, uh, uh, sometimes this, it was 50 diopters, and we don't have this IOL power uh, in presence, so uh, we had to perform uh, two intraocular lenses implantation. Uh, the first one, a 30 diopter lens, and the other one was uh, 25 in, uh, uh, diopters. How old uh, is the patient? The patient was uh, 35 years of age. And the depth of the anterior chamber? The depth of the anterior chamber, fortunately, was good. It was uh, around 3.2 uh, millimeters in depth, which was convenient enough for us to perform such a surgery. And do you remember uh, you the excellence? It was, I think it was 19, as far as I remember. Wow. The, the trick here is, or the, 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 the question that should be raised here, should we implant one intraocular lens in the bag and the other one in the sulcus or put the two uh, lenses inside the bag? Uh, I usually do my cases with both lenses in the bag as I achieve good centration uh, this way because in doing one sulcus and one, uh, in the bag, sometimes they, they do not center in front of each other quite well. And uh, most of the visual results in such cases, I find them to be uh, satisfactory and convenient. And the calculation uh, of the power. Sorry? Calculation of the power. How do you divide the powers of the lens? And you divide it equally? Like 50, no, 25, I, I, I divide or? it with the, the, the lens that uh, would be introduced first would be of higher uh, power and the uh, superficial one would be of less power uh, because it's in this way it's a little bit thinner and sometimes you may need to do IOL exchange in such cases in order to recorrect refractive errors and so you you need to, to remove the smaller power lens which is usually placed in the front rather than uh, placing the uh, the higher uh, power lens in the front. So I prefer uh, no equal power. I prefer a small power lens in the front uh, and a large power lens in uh, the back. Uh, if the lens was clear, which was not such a case, I resort to now uh, specially manufactured lenses uh, to be placed as uh, ICLs or IPCLs, which I find uh, quite convenient uh, because still performing surgeries in such cases carries some risk 
as we all know that uh, the risk of expulsive hemorrhage in such cases, once you do some decompression, is very high. So it's, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it might look quite easy, but usually it's not because you might encounter some uh, drastic uh, problems in such cases. And you're doing it a local anesthesia or general anesthesia? Yes, yes, local anesthesia. Again, the lens here is not quite dense, so it can be removed using only the FACO uh, machine without using a second instrument or a chopper. Uh, the use of a chopper might be only uh, in order to aid in performing the surgery. Um, otherwise, uh, you can uh, swiftly and easily remove uh, the nucleus uh, in such cases. And then comes the difficult part in placing the uh, intraocular lenses, both uh, one after each other. You have to inflate the bag uh, as much as possible. Uh, it's amazing how the bag can uh, take up two lenses because usually the amount of lens matter is quite uh, thick and uh, it allows for easily implantation of both types of intraocular lenses. Uh, with uh, quite ease and it's not difficult at all but you have to use each time you implant an intraocular lens you have to use an ample amount of viscoelastic this is uh, the first intraocular lens to be placed inside the, the, the eye you will see here <clears throat> You aim directly inside the back. Be, be careful, careful that you should inflate uh, the intraocular, the, the bag with viscoelastic. A huge amount of viscoelastic is required, especially when you are trying to introduce the second lens. This is the first lens. It's a hydrophilic the... acrylic, this one? Or yes, yes, yes. You, you, hydrophilic you, prefer acrylic. Two, you prefer two hydrophilic? Yes, two hydrophilic acrylics. And then I use viscoelastic once again. And then we will put our second lens uh, after we finish implanting the first one. This is the second lens coming now. It's easily to replace the second lens, so you have to be very careful to put it in the bag. Because, it, because there is another lens inside the bag, you can easily misplace the, your second lens and put it in the sulcus. And being an acrylic hydrophilic, it will definitely be decentered. So in order to, up, to achieve proper centration with overlapping of both lenses exactly opposite each other and coaxially, you have to place the second lens and be sure that your lens is in the back. Once you have achieved this, you can uh, remove all the viscoelastic that uh, is remaining from the, uh, from the inside the eye and uh, the procedure is then concluded. Very, very interesting. But I, I have no experience with uh, piggyback. I always, I, I always never liked them. Do you like them? Uh, me, me next time, I'm going to go to going to show you a complication with the piggyback uh, lens. Uh, but most of my cases, almost all of my cases, I achieved good centration and good results. Uh, I, I prefer to put the highest. Uh, uh, power and then maybe the idea of ICL over the the lens uh, is more appealing for me. This is a good choice too. Definitely, I can go for this. It's uh, uh, quite convenient, but uh, it would to, to require another procedure and more costs for the patient. So of course, yes. Yeah, and you have to think about it, and then you consult with your patient and see what's better for him. And then you can both decide, um, even though the patient usually tells you, you are the doctor, you should decide. <laughs> okay. Very nice. Thank you. Dr. Yahya, you have the... Uh, 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 can I was still, if you have a question, I'm going to show a managing complication. We are aware we can have complications. And, and uh, one of the major complications is posterior rupture. Posterior rupture can occur at any stage during the 
fake woman certification with the early or late, but the most I knowing one also is if it, if it, if it happens late. And, and I'm on mute. I'm on mute. Oh, I didn't share the screen. Yeah, you need to share it. It's not shared. Okay, I'm sorry. Is it shared like this? Yes. Okay. The desktop call. Okay. Yeah. Now, yes. Now the presentation. So uh, uh, the idea that the complication can happen at any moment, and that one of the uh, and this a point is when you have it happens during irrigation patient and remember it is not uncommon yeah statistically it's like 20 percent or more from posterior ruptures occur during irrigation aspiration once you start to be be more relaxed one of the things in posterior rupture the rules is, the rules is first try always to see well with good magnification so you can see the complication happening so you can prevent further complication. And if the complication happens and you see it, you can manage it in a much better way than you wait for the complication to increase and manifest to you with secondary signs that you don't have to wait for this. So the key is to identify that there is a problem. Then you have a plan how to manage. Always, if the posterior capsule is open, ask yourself the question, is there is vitreous or no vitreous loss? Each one you will manage in a different direction. So the question has to be answered very abruptly. So here, irrigation aspiration, look, everything looks fine. Now, you see here, I'll show it again in slow motion. You can see here, I'm holding the posterior capsule with this bubble obscuring my visualization, and then what happened is there is a tear in the posterior capsule. It would be obvious. So I did a mistake. Mechanically, I opened the posterior capsule with the aspirating carrier. So I stop, see if there is vitreous or no vitreous. See, evaluate how much is the opening. If there is vitreous, I have to deal with the vitreous. If there is no vitreous, I have to make sure I don't introduce or make vitreous loss so first thing you identify there is a problem you see the opening so notice what i did i went out with the spreading cannula keeping the irrigation in to avoid the pressure gradient between the posterior segment and the anterior segment if you go out directly with the uh, irrigation then the vitreous will move forward and this will increase the tear so the first thing you identify there is a tear you see there is no vitreous you go out with the aspiration inject viscoelastic to equalize the pressure in front and behind the capsule and then pull out the irrigation you can see the tear here is ellipse you can see the edges of the tear. Viscoelastic in, irrigation out, making sure to tamponate the tear and tamponate the anterior vitreous phase. Focusing on the tear. And now, after evaluation, the tear, the decision here, you can have different decisions either you say okay i see the tear the bag is not clean yet i can clean with a dry aspiration the cortex and then implant in the sulcus or you can try to convert there is a, a filament from the, the capsule i cut it inject viscoelastic so my decision here was to convert this elliptical tear into a continuous opening in the posterior capsule without interfering with the vitreous phase by injecting viscoelastic through the opening to tamponade the anterior vitreous phase and then viscoelastic in front of the posterior capsule and with good magnification and control you can convert the ellipse tear that can easily extend 
into a round costier capsular tape. Once you do this, then you can make sure that you are going to implant the lens in the bag. I still have cortex here. I'm now injecting viscoelastic to push the vitreous bag and, and inflate the, what is remaining of the bag. I have the capsular axis anterior here. Now I decided to inject the lens. This is hydrophobic acrylic lens implanted in the capsular bag. I know I have still remaining cortex here. Making sure the lens is injected inside the capsular bag well centered, making sure that you are in front of the posterior capsular axis, behind of the anterior axis. Once you have done this, you have sealed the opening with the optic, then you can do irrigation aspiration as, as normal. So the message here that you should identify a problem at any point when it is happening, so you can avoid further complications and you can change your plan to achieve the best possible result that will not alter your post-operative uh, results. Dr. Wade, Dr. Sharif, any comments? Excellent, Dr. Yahya. Very nice operation. I, uh, and uh, very nice session. I enjoyed this session very much. And uh, we have seen lots of uh, different types of surgeries and different complications and different management. It was really fruitful for me to watch. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for a last uh, video or are we get a, too much for the audience? Um, Natalie, we can conclude the word. Time, خلاص. So we don't uh, make it too long for uh, our audience. Uh, would you like to take uh, like a couple of questions from the audience, yeah, Dr. Yahya? And we can have another session maybe next week to complete other interesting cases then. Excellent, excellent. So yes, I would love to as there are lots of videos to show. Wow. Yeah, this is a good promise, so we can make another session. And uh, so this concludes our, uh, our cases today. And uh, we are very uh, thankful to Dr. Yahya and Dr. Sharif uh, for their amazing uh, videos and uh, amazing contribution. And they're uh, always supportive for us, all, our, all of us. And uh, thank you to our audience. I hope this uh, session was uh, good. Thank you, Dr. Well, for your efforts. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, as we said, as we said, we're uh, we're going to be meeting on Monday with Dr. Debra, and uh, we're going to be meeting on Wednesday with Dr. Heba, and we have a surprise to you on Friday. We will announce it soon. And uh, uh, thank you very much for being us with us today. And uh, good night, everybody. Yeah. So kind of way. Very good.